Welcome, everybody. I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm Carol Anthony from the Center for Peace and Justice Education. We're delighted to have all of you here. And I must tell you that looking around the room, I'm, I'm like, and I shared this with Catherine also, you are in the presence of an amazing group of people, all of you, because you really are. So many of you I know, and I know you as people who are just absolutely amazing and doing phenomenal work to truly try to uh, right the wrongs of society and make the world a better place. So um, I thank you all for coming here. And certainly, if you're a leader of one of the student groups in the Center for Peace and Justice, Caitlin has a sign-up sheet just so that we know that you were here, or it's down there, right there. OK, this, is, this event is part of the Oscar Romero uh, lecture series, if you will, that we usually have in the spring. And the focus is on solidarity. And when we decided that we would have this, particularly in light of the new student group, SRIHA, um, which is Student Run Emergency Housing in Philadelphia, and knowing that there was this growing interest in serving and working with the homeless, uh, we decided it would be terrific to have someone who knows a tremendous amount of what it is to live and work with the poor, or what solidarity means. And that is Mary Beth Appel here and I will introduce her in a minute. She was the first one that came immediately to mind, and then we thought it would be absolutely great to sort of continue the tradition with people who are working on campus to speak from their experience and perspective, what is it like to live and work in solidarity. We have Erin Weaver right there, who's from Street Hub, who works directly with the, the people in the emergency shelter. Do you work with the men? There? Yes. Okay. And Katie McAloon is, has a different experience in working for water for Waslala. And so there is trying to work with and for people in many ways oftentimes that you don't know, whose faces you don't know, but whose situation you know is dire and there's something that you can do about it. So there's two types of, at least in terms of the student groups, sort of two different experiences of working either directly or indirectly with people. Um, so, as I said, our key speaker, if you will, and we're going to just have a panel of Mary Beth will be the key speaker and speak for about 25 minutes on her experiences, and then we'll turn it over to uh, each one of our other panelists to share their perspective and thoughts on things. Now, um, folks, if you can not sit there and sit over there, because the panelists are in front of you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is wonderful that we are filling up the seats. Well, Mary Beth Appel is homegrown, okay, in that you grew up in this area, correct? You're Springfield, Springfield. Springfield area. Uh, went to Cardinal O'Hara. Any Cardinal O'Hara alums here now? Um, and then she came to Villanova and, and graduated in 1981, where Villanova was mm -hmm. a different but similar place. Okay. Um, and she graduated with a degree in nursing and went on to get a later on an MS, a Master's of Science in Nursing or something like that, and also became a certified family nurse practitioner, right, CFNP. Um, in the late 80s, I believe, tell me if I'm right, uh, she decided to become a Catholic worker. And um, she started a Catholic worker house of grace with Joanna Bergen in Philadelphia. And they also started um, a free health clinic in Kensington. And the free health clinic there um, offered medical and dental services to the poor, the homeless that were in and around the Kensington area. And everything, it was a free health clinic. So that was incredibly innovative and really spoke to a tremendous need um, in the community. I had Mary Beth speak, uh, it turns out it's 10 years ago now, in my class. And it's one of those experiences that I have shared in numerous classes after that. It was that impactful. Um, so she has a lot to say about her growth and development and understanding what it means to work in solidarity with people. And so please welcome Mary Beth Appel. Thank you all for coming. This is kind of amazing. Uh, I thought maybe can we start with just like a brief moment of silence just to people gather their thoughts and say a little prayer or whatever.
I think the topic of solidarity is actually uh, one that for me is, is what I would call a lifelong challenge. I, and I think it's sort of like a goal to be attained. It's nothing that I feel like I've really ever gotten to. And the first story that jumped in, into my mind thinking about solidarity was um, I worked for several summers with migrant farm workers doing migrant health where we ran a migrant clinic um, for the farm workers, the people who picked the vegetables in the field. And we would go out to the labor camps to visit each and every labor camp every week. We'd go out in the evening. So we really got to know the people. We got to know the families. We got to know the kids. They would make tortillas for us. And we, we just really were able to really connect with them in a really deep way. We, we knew a lot of extended families. And because of this experience, I, um, I actually went and lived on the Texas-Mexican border for three months to learn Spanish. So my high school Spanish wasn't getting me too far. And to, um, and to kind of bet, get a, even a better understanding of farm workers. At that point, I did some activism work and a little bit of health education with the United Farm Workers Union. I picketed around the great boycott. And I was feeling, you know, pretty cool about my work with farm workers. And then this little girl who was on one of the labor camps, Rosita, kept tell, asking me every week, would I please come out to the fields with them? So I'm like, uh-huh, uh -huh, OK. So one day, I went out with their family and the whole labor camp to the field to pick tomatoes down in Virginia, where I was working for the summer. They said I had to dress in long pants, long sleeves, and gloves, and, and a hat. It was very hot. And, uh, and the, the farm workers make 40 cents for every, they made 40 cents for every 35 pound bucket that they could pick. And I believe that they have just gotten a penny a pound raise, courtesy of all the boycotts around with the Immokalee workers and the Taco Bell and all, if you've heard about that. So I dutifully am picking the green tomatoes. And first, first problem was I couldn't lift the bucket. So I had to lift the bucket up over my head into the truck. So little Rosita, who's 12, and her brother, who's 11, just poof, picked the bucket up. So four hours later, I picked about 15 buckets of tomatoes. You do the math. I'm not going to be a million. I'm barely going to have money to buy lunch from what I've made. The average tomato picking capacity is about 150 to 200 buckets a day for most of the folks. And I was covered from head to toe with this blue-green pesticide gunk that had wiped off the tomatoes. And I kind of begged off the afternoon, had to leave after breakfast. I was with another one of the migrant health nurses. I went back to where we lived, threw up, took my clothes off, took a shower, washed the clothes. The blue did not come off and still felt sick two days later. And I thought, hmm, I guess I haven't quite gotten to solidarity yet. I still have a ways to go. And, and I had never heard a farm worker complain. I had never heard anyone talk about any of sort of just how hard it really, really is. And I think that was one insight into just the struggles, the struggles of people. And people really, really struggle. And, you know, we never really fully understand that. You know, we, they talk about till you walk a mile in another person's shoes. Well, we're really all having trouble, I think, walking in our own shoes. And, so just to, you know, to just develop some kind of a compassion and understanding of other people, though it may be faulty, I, for me, has just been like a, a challenge. So I thought, since I'm at Villanova, I'll tell a couple of stories from my time at Villanova. I was so excited as a freshman to sign up for the spring break trip. There was one. It was to Appalachia. I was, like, ecstatic. It was going to be so much fun. And it was just amazing. We had a great time. It was, it was fabulous. We drove to Kentucky. And then, and then from that, I sort of kind of caught the bug of wanting to do community work, service work, spent a month that summer in West Virginia. And that, that whole experience really, really sort of solidified in me uh, what I see as a lifelong commitment to work with poor and marginalized people. And I remember sitting around on a boat in a pond in Wheeling, West Virginia with the other people I was with that summer. And we had this great plan. We were going to start this health clinic in West Virginia. And we all, we had each different, you know, specialty covered. There was a social worker and the whatever, the 
carpenter and the nurse. So, so it was just like a bug that I caught, and I felt that, you know, this is, this is really great. This is just something I really wanted to do. And then fast forward a couple of years, Ray Jackson, who is, I'm guessing, just legend to most of you, uh, who had been a campus minister, and I, I believe he was like the person who started Peace and Justice Education. He, he would have said he started it by himself. Yeah. Yes. Um, there are other people who dispute that, but he was one of the best. So I never was able to take a Peace and Justice class because nurses couldn't really do anything. Um, but he got shifted from Villanova to become pastor of a South Philly parish. So of course he invited. So that was the second spring break trip was St. Rita's in South Philly, which a bunch of my friends and I went to spring break junior year. We loved it, so we figured out a way to get ourselves back that summer, and we ended up going spring break and summer of my junior and senior year. And uh, we just had a blast. And that was significantly less glamorous than Appalachia. And it just was a real different shift, just the inner city of the city that I had grown up near, you know, and it just had a different shift. And there was, the lights didn't go on. It wasn't like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to live in inner city Philly. It wasn't like that at all. But it gave me a chance to get to know people and still another way. We worked in people's homes. And, and I feel like little by little by little sort of things were solidifying in, in sort of striving towards this goal of being in solidarity. I think a lot of stuff I read during high school and college and a lot of sermons I heard also kind of kicked all this kind of stuff around in my head. So in my 20s, I worked with, with poor people, both urban and rural, and with disabled people in a variety of settings in a few different cities. And by the late 80s, I really love working with the people. And I love what I did, but I always felt like I couldn't really do what I wanted to do because there was this like huge load of bureaucracy and red tape. I had always worked for nonprofits, and it, there were just all these constraints, constraints on my time about how connected you could get, oh, don't get too close, and, and it just became a real struggle for me. And at the same time, I was renting a room in Chestnut Hill, which is a real fancy part of the city, and I would drive through increasingly more poor neighborhoods every day to get down to North Philadelphia, where I worked and where I did some volunteer work as well. And I just felt like that my life was sort of schizophrenic. I had, I was like sort of sitting on this fence, and I was like trying to, trying to straddle both sides of the fence, because at the end of the day, I would drive back through the progressively nicer neighborhoods to my very comfortable little room in Chestnut Hill. So the combination of those two things, I, I was kind of burnt out and was like, oh, I just got to get out of this country. So I decided oh, I'll be a missionary. That'll be a, it's a great thing. Escape. When in doubt, run away. Um, <laughs> so at that point, I, so I well researched this project because I like to research things. So I went to Central America for a month, visited a few different countries, fell in love with El Salvador, was determined this was where I was going to go, and I was going to go to a place that did change and justice work, not charity work, because we all know why, since you all take peace and justice education, why change is good. Um, so then the civil war that had been going on there for a decade had gotten way, way worse, and at least one, if not more, young American women got kidnapped. So none of the NGOs were going to take young American women at this point, or men, I think. So that just sort of nixed my dream. So I was really relatively crushed. I had quit my job. I had totaled my car, accidentally, of course. I had given away my house plants and had a party, but I had nowhere to go. So. So I went out with my Catholic worker friends who were boycotting grapes at the local grocery store and I was leafleting against grapes and somebody said, I'm like, I want to go to, I want to use my Spanish, I want to go to a Spanish-speaking country, I want to do healthcare, blah, blah, blah. He was like, okay, why don't you go to the Los Angeles Catholic worker? It's in the Hispanic neighborhood, they run a health clinic, they have a soup kitchen, they live in community, everybody there speaks Spanish. So I'm like, okay. So I'll sign up, but just for one year. So that was 1989. So I signed up for the year, and it was just fabulous. I mean, it was so great to, to have so many of the walls come down, because we lived in the, the, the Catholic worker charism 
Is everybody familiar with the Catholic Worker? Pretty much? No. Well, it was founded by Dorothy Day. I'll spare the rest of the details. But a big part of the charism is hospitality. We live in community and we live in the same house with the people who would otherwise be homeless. So this is a totally different experience. I had had a variety of experiences short term of living in community with other kind of like-minded souls, but this was my first time of living in community with, with homeless people. And you, it really does shift, shift sort of how you look at things when you're living, when you're reaching for coffee out of the same coffee pot and waiting in line for the bathroom and whatever, you know, taking turns sweeping the floor and living in community with a bunch of folks that you would otherwise not really have the occasion to get to know at such a personal level. So that, so that really took a lot of the shades off my eyes and that it's just a great learning experience for me. And, and we learned there how to, um, how to run a health clinic. They had an existing health clinic. They had a huge soup kitchen. I learned to make like 50 gallons of soup a day. That was a fun thing to learn. And it was just a really good experience, but I was kind of homesick, so I ended up coming back to Philadelphia, and out at the Los Angeles Worker was Johanna Berrigan, who was also from Pennsylvania and also a little homesick. So I twisted her arm and talked her into coming and starting a health clinic here in Philly. She is a, was a nurse and has since become a physician assistant. Um, so we, we asked the St. Francis Inn, where I know Villanova goes a lot of people have probably been there, to, to borrow space. We weren't sure how we were going to get, we weren't really sure what we were going to do or how we were going to do it. So we thought, let's just bring a couple boxes of Band-Aids and some Tylenol. Well, that lasted about a day, and it became obvious that the need was sort of overwhelming. So we were able to start the free clinic. They let us use the second floor above the soup kitchen. And uh, we stayed there for six years. We ended up buying a house in the neighborhood, a house of hospitality, where we started taking in people. Um, a couple of years later, we got a space for the clinic. The clinic's now in a very small um, row house on the same block as St. Francis. And if any of you were ever at St. Francis when we're open, come on down. Um, and, you know, have operated the house of hospitality. We have community gardens. And part of the Catholic worker, um, Charism is sort of making the world a little bit more beautiful. So we're, we have these community gardens, which is a really lovely thing. It, it sort of brightens up what were a bunch of vacant lots. Um, we have a big mural on the wall at the garden. And, um, and we just kind of moved in and are living in the neighborhood. Another part of the worker is simple lifestyle. And I think simple lifestyle is one of the or voluntary poverty, whatever, however you want to call it, is one of sort of the biggest struggles because and, and really being in solidarity. This is sort of the tricky part about solidarity. Well, we're, we're in the neighborhood. We live in the neighborhood, but there's always a little, we're, we're, di like, we're different. We're like helpers, you know, and we're more educated than a lot of the neighbors and kind of travel a lot more and just have a lot more opportunities than a lot of, than a lot of other folks do. So, so even though we sort of progressively taking more steps towards solidarity, the things are still a little, you know, not, not real, real even. Um, and then about 10 years ago, um, we took kids in as foster kids who have been subsequently adopted. And I feel for me that really was a, a shift in the neighborhood about feeling way more connected to the neighborhood, sending the kids to the local schools, going to the local, first the Head Start, then the local Catholic school, um, looking for the local sports teams and just kind of getting to know the neighbors in a different way and getting to really see people differently. Um, uh, but at the same time, raising kids has sort of raised, has, has had me kind of look at the neighborhood and where we live through, through a different set of eyes, through the eyes of a mom trying to protect her kids and seeing, seeing the needles from the heroin, seeing the broken glass, seeing the, just all the dirt, having, Whoever's passed out on the corner, like, look up and say, hi, Mary Beth, you know, with my kids trying along. Do you know him? I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, it's just, it, it's a little different. And I think it's a, I think there, it's a great, it's a great way to raise kids in some ways, but in other ways, it, it definitely poses its own set of, set of challenges. Um, 
you know, we've, we've always just gotten our clothes or whatever used, and, you know, to have kids ask for Nike sneakers for Christmas, you go like, okay. Um, and sort of what, kind of what does that mean? Um, so, so I feel like that, was a, that has really helped to break down the barriers a little bit more. Um, we, and then one of the, the, the cat, a, a lot of, we use the term the works of mercy a lot because a lot of our work and our projects really are the works of mercy, you know, like feed the hungry and clothe the naked and heal the sick and all that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of times as we're, as we're doing this work and seeing the injustices and hearing people's stories, it causes us to act. So another part of the Catholic worker would be the peace work. We're pacifists, and we do a lot of action as far as vigils, protests, standing up against various injustices. Um, so for example, in LA, when we were at a protest around the war in El Salvador, which was El Salvador being near and dear to my heart, you know, I, when given the opportunity, yes, I was part of a group of people that risked arrest, spent a couple days in jail. And I, and I think that for, for me, just that whole kind of peace and th that connection of kind of looking at the injustices and what do we do about them. And we've maintained weekly vigils for years and years against a variety of things. We, now we just have a general peace vigil against war. We've done work against the death penalty and the School of the Americas and different things. And I think that for me, that's one of the pieces I love so much about the Catholic worker is there's that connection where we're doing sort of the charity work and the helping kind of work, but we're also kind of looking at the injustices. We do a newsletter. I brought a little bit of propaganda with me. I know there's a bunch of, there's a whole lot of New York Catholic worker newsletters at the Center for Peace and Justice, and for the first time ever on the front page is an article by Johanna, who's with me at the House of Grace. It's sort of one of her reflections. We have a small clinic in Haiti, too, that she started and she runs, and that's a story for another day. But one of her reflections on Haiti is in the, the recent newsletter. And then those of you who are scholarly and are interested in um, kind of the peace and justice and sort of the, the more scholarly background on the Catholic worker, the aims and means are in the, the newspaper from May, which are just kind of a series of critiques. We sort of critique labor, politics, morals, economics and then try to respond by sort of decent, a decentralized response, the green revolution, trying to get people back to the land where they're, you know, there's a huge critique by many people, the worker being one of, as, as people's work gets more and more disconnected from the end product, like figure working with like a cog in a factory or whatever and missing the, the end product and getting back to the roots, to the farm, um, that that helps bring people back to a more personal fullness. A lot of people really don't have the opportunity to, to live fully because of this sort of disconnect between their work, you know, so they're working in a miserable job, pick whatever miserable job you want to make enough money to buy the groceries to, to feed their family and live in a miserable little place instead of having your work be growing the food that you're going to eat and feed your family with. Um, so we, we do believe in manual labor, voluntary poverty, the works of mercy, nonviolence. And a lot, of the, a lot of that has to do with personalism. And personalism is, I, say, I see it as sort of two different things. One, it's um, is not, not just asking the state or the government to do stuff. It's just us doing stuff. And then it's doing stuff to the level that you feel most comfortable for and kind of maybe taking a step beyond with folks. And I realize it's almost 25 minutes. Uh, a couple thoughts of different people that I just wanted to throw out who've lived with us. One is a guy named Harvey who, um, who came in probably for three years for vitamins every two weeks, and that's all I ever came in. Came in the clinic, fame, you know, vitamin, vitamin, vitamin. We, hi, Harvey, hi, Harvey. Didn't, knew some of his friends and knew some of his family, but didn't really connect. And then one day he came in, he had just gotten a positive HIV test, and he came to us because we were the people that he felt the most connected to to talk about that and to sort of deal with the, his new HIV positive status, which at the time this happened, that was pretty much a death sentence. 
Um, and then as he got sicker, we were able to bring him home, and he lived with us for, for several months before he got into an AIDS hospice and subsequently died. So that was, that was a way that personalism kind of takes you a little bit beyond just the, you know, the, the not real close interaction, you know, just to kind of make a little bit more connection. Another one is a woman named Debbie who um, came to the clinic and showered. She was the first person in the shower line. She always had her transistor radio, headphones in, and she's a really sweet person. It wasn't until she began to get sick and we began to talk to her at greater depth that we realized she was completely schizophrenic and had never been treated. Um, and then she developed ovarian cancer. So she's somebody else who we brought home. We talked to her, we begged her. It took us like a year to get her to go for care to, you know, because she didn't really believe in cancer treatment because the nature of some mental illnesses is a lot of paranoia. So she was really scared of the treatment. So she came and lived with us for a while all the way. So she, she said she would come for one night, just her first post-op night. Well, she stayed about a year and then moved on. And then uh, she's, really, she's really a trip. She's such a funny person. She loved the pets. She, she just loved to clean. She loved to decorate with Christmas lights. Hello. Um, um, so sort of like she moved in and then she was decorating and cleaning and she was just like so great to have around. And um, she, about three years ago, we hadn't seen her, we lost touch with her after she moved out and she just knocked on the door about eight in the, in the morning. I lost my apartment, whatever, some, some eviction happened that had nothing to do with her. It was like they sold the house. Yous is the only family I have. So she came back and lived with us, was actually able through connections with legal aid lawyers and all to get a disability check to live out, to go and live independently. And she would, she would watch the dog. She, she would even watch the kids occasionally. She, she's been, her mental health was in much better state at that point. Um, so it's just really neat to make those connections. There was another time when we were, um, there's, there's usually three or four of us in community, but at this particular time we were kind of new, just had started the house and we were feeling really overwhelmed. And I think Johanna was in school and somebody had just left the community and we were just like desperate. And we had a house full of guests and this priest actually brought this woman with this little toddler to the door and asked if we would take them in. And we're like, oh, the last thing we need is another family because we already have five people or whatever. Um, and it was, the room, it was the room of a worker that was empty. So normally we wouldn't have had that many guests. We usually try to keep it half and half. And uh, so she, we said, oh, okay, okay, well, didn't she like love to cook? So she like cooked for us for the next six months. So bringing her in was such a gift to us. We got to know the family. Her 12 year old son came from Columbia and she was a bit messy divorce situation. And um, we've kept in touch. The toddler just got a full ride scholarship to Penn. He's turned out to be unbelievably brilliant and lovely. His older brother has two kids of his own and we're still in touch. He teaches at a Catholic school in Philly. So it's just, been so great to kind of be able to make these connections that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, we take, we've been taking in, in recent years, refugees and immigrants, and if people want to, I'm <coughs> going to stop now probably. We can talk about that in a, in a question if anybody specifically um, has uh, interest in refugees or immigrants. So I thought I'd just end with a quote. I have a whole bunch of quotes from Dorothy Day. Um, and I think I'll read this one. What we would like to do is change the world, make it a little simpler for people to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves as God intended them to do. And by fighting for better conditions, by crying out unceasingly for the work, rights of the workers, the poor, of the destitute, the rights of the worthy and the unworthy poor, in other words, we can to a certain extent change the world. We can work for the oasis, the little cell of joy and peace in a harried world. We can throw our pebble in the pond and be confident that its ever widening circle will reach around the world. 
we repeat there is nothing we can do but love. And dear God, please enlarge our hearts to love each other, to love our neighbor, and to love our enemy as our friend. Okay, so my name is Katie Macklin, and I'm here to represent Waterford Sala and kind of give another perspective to solidarity. Um, so just a little background on Waterford Sala for people who don't know. It was founded in 2004 by two Villanova grads, um, and it basically the the goal of Waterford Sala is to build clean water systems in uh, Masala, which is a municipality in Nicaragua. So it provides funds and technical expertise um, needed to construct cost-effective and sustainable potable water systems. And the two Villanova students actually went on a break trip to Oslala and saw a need for clean water there, came back to Villanova and wanted to do more, so they founded Water for Oslala. And its goal is to provide the 45,000 uh, residents of Oslala with clean water, and since its founding, it's um, given 3,000 people access to clean water. So, Oslalans there are in charge of designing, building, and maintaining the water systems to make it as sustainable as possible, and it builds community organization and empowerment and sustainability. Um, so Water for Salon does heavily on training with Salons to do it themselves. And then on campus, our student group is comprised of three co-chairs, myself and two other girls, two co-chairs in training, and then a student, or a core team of about 12 st other students who um, our primary goals are to raise money and for the larger organization and to raise awareness about the global water crisis. Um, so I think we kind of have a different version of solidarity because most people in the student group have never been to Asala. I think out of our core team, maybe two, maybe three people have ever even been to Asala. So most of the people are, are working for individuals who they've never actually met. And you know, I, hopefully I would like to go to Asala one day, but realistically I don't know if that'll happen. So odds are I might be working for people who I never will meet. Um, so it can be kind of hard to live in, in solidarity with, with strangers. Um, but I think that we can get our solidarity through unity and mutual support and just through symbols of showing unification with, with Solins. Um And one example of that is one thing that really struck, struck me was there's a documentary on Wasala, which we're actually showing next Tuesday for a student group meeting. Um, and I'm watching this documentary, it's about Wasala's work, and one scene is a Jeep driving through rural Wasala, and on the back of the Jeep is a Villanova University bumper sticker. So I just thought that was really interesting that, you know, this school is thousands of miles away, and they know who we are, and, you know, know that we support them, and that we're living in solidarity with them, and you watch the documentaries, or you see pictures from Wasala, and they're always wearing Villanova shirts, Villanova break trip shirts, um, and then if you come to Villanova's campus, if you look on computers, now we have Waterfall Solid stickers, and look all over campus, you'll see Waterfall Solid stickers. So I think, and you can see like, you know, Walk for Water shirts all over campus. So I think you can, you can show your solidarity through symbols like that, that we're, we're living in support of each other by recognizing each other and recognizing the support that we give each other. Um, and then I think our student group can also live in solidarity with the Solins through just hard work in supporting them. Um, our two big events are, we have Water Awareness Day in the fall, which is just a day to raise awareness about the global water crisis. And um, you know we put signs all over campus with clean water facts, and we show a documentary. Um, and then in the spring, we have our Walk for Water, which is our biggest fundraiser. And we, most years, raise over $20,000 for Water for Sala. Um, so I think in that way, that's a form of living in solidarity, just you know, working hard for the other person and keeping their goals in mind. Um, and then also just through a common interest. You know, we're all, both with Solins and Villanova students on campus are all working towards the same thing. We're all working to solve the global water crisis. And even though that might not be something that affects us daily, it's through educating ourselves about it that we can live in solidarity because we're aware of the problems that other people are facing, even if we don't face it. And it allows us to become more appreciative of what we have, I think. And I think a good example of that, and this is one of the most concrete examples of solidarity that Water Fosali uses, um, and this is more of the traditional version of solidarity, I think, which entails, you know, actually being in touch with the people you serve, is on Water Awareness Day, we have something called a solidarity tank. And what it is, we wanted, we wanted to do something that put us more in solidarity with Fosalans besides, you know, just raising money and raising awareness. So. Two years ago, last year was our second year doing, or no, that last year was our third year doing it. So we've done it three years in a row now. The Solidarity Tank um, represents 
one clean water source like people in many underdeveloped countries have that you know they have to walk miles just to get to clean water so we have students sign a pledge here to live in the solidarity tank for a day during water Wednesday day in the fall and we'll have a jug of water at the Oreo that's filled with clean water and we challenge students to every time you need water for the day walk to that water source to get water um, you know and it helps us just walk in the shoes of us all in for a day and it's always been very eye-opening for me my sophomore year I did it for the first time and I lived in alumni so I thought it was no big deal it's a two-second walk but this year I live off campus so every time I need clean water I'd have to drive to campus which is a 10 minute drive but which seemed like a long distance compared to my walk to alumni but then you know when we really stopped to reflect on it we realized that a 10 minute drive is much different from you know a 10 mile walk which is what a lot of people have to do um, so it's it's definitely a big educational tool about all aspects of clean water just even like health you don't realize how much you use clean water until you have to go walk somewhere to get it you know every time after you use the bathroom we for that day weren't allowed to just wash our hands we had to go all the way to solidarity tank to wash our hands so it made us think a lot about health and sanitation and things that don't that we take for luxury here that might not exist in other countries um, and you definitely become more aware of how much water you use in a day and how much you take for granted the convenience of it so that I mean I really appreciate it being able to experience that solidarity tank because it is more of a concrete example of solidarity um, and I think our organization kind of enacts a different a different type of solidarity in in our everyday experiences and it's not the typical sense because we don't live with the people we're serving we might not ever meet the people we're serving but I think Waterfall Solid can and all organizations even if you don't necessarily work directly with people can still live in solidarity just through you know education and awareness and advocacy I think it's definitely still an attainable goal hi um, for those of you that don't know me my name is Erin Weaver I am the uh, president of the three hub chapter here at Villanova um, Three HEP stands for Student Run Emergency Housing Units of Philadelphia. Uh, we also have chapters at Penn, Drexel, Swarthmore, and Temple. So depending on who you ask, we have between 200 and 400 volunteers. Um, and the amazing thing is that this project started simply as an idea um, a little over a year ago. And now we have three shelters all in Philadelphia. Our first one is Old First, which is for 30 homeless men and what makes 3HEP special is we keep the same guests for the whole winter. So I've been working with these guys since November and I'm going to continue to work with them until April. And unlike a lot of shelters where you might get a bed for one night or one week, um, we really get to know these guys. Um, they've become my friends and we build connections that a lot of shelters don't have and it becomes more of a home than just a shelter where they can you know, have a roof over their head, which is important but I think that aspect of solidarity is really important too. Um, so we have an old first shelter for 30 homeless men. We have um, an LGBT shelter that is for 18 to 24 year olds who are largely homeless because after they came out to their parents they were kicked out and had nowhere to go. Um, and then our last shelter is for 30 chronically homeless men, men that have been homeless for years and years as opposed to just a few months, like unlike the first shelter. Um, like I said, we try to offer a home to Sri Hub, and that has a lot of components. Um, we have a dinner every night that students or usually adult volunteers that have a lot easier access to kitchens um, and supermarkets, unlike most students here, um, come in, make a dinner, and um, that starts at about 5:30. Um, usually, when students are there, we set up tables, put down. We try to make like try to make it nice, so it's usually in a big you so that everyone can kind of see each other when we sit to eat and we call it family dinner because it really is kind of like a family um, and then the guests come in at seven and that's always my favorite part of the shift because I just love these guys I've gotten to know them so well um, and they really are my friends uh, when I when they walk in the door the first one that walks in every night is Hector and he always gives me a big hug because he's so excited that I'm there um, he's so sweet and his daughter <laughs> I saw that. I love her. Yeah, he's, a, he's hilarious. I love him so much. He does this really funny thing where he stands behind the other ga guys when they're talking to me and he just like makes fun of them. Um, and <laughs> they have no idea that he does it. It's just hilarious. His daughter goes to Temple um, 
and he's just one of the nicest guys. He talks about this farm that he has back home um, that his uncle runs. It's just, it was great to get to know him and get to know his story. Um, there's Bruce who, the first words that he says whenever he sees me are, how are your grades? Um, like without fail, needs to know that I'm still getting A's. Um, and he always tells me that he's so proud of me for everything that I do and that he is the most thankful person I've ever met and just thanks us profusely for everything we do for Rehab. And it's just so touching. Um, and I always say thank you right back because getting to know him has really changed my perspective um, on homelessness and on that population and you know what it really means to be homeless and how it really affects someone. And then getting to see as time has gone on and they've none of them realize that they're homeless anymore, I don't think. Like we kind of try not to say that word because I don't it kind of almost feels awkward because they have a home and it's with us. Um, and a, a couple of the guys, we've actually had some success. Some of them have already moved out into housing and some of them have housing lined up for when we close in April. So we are really excited to see that success. Um, there's Steve who always makes it a point to tell me how poorly Villanova played last night, <laughs> like without fail. <laughs> and uh, I always wear my Villanova shirts and he always makes fun of me for it. Um, there's this guy, Wilbur, who is just obsessed with fishing, and I've talked to him so many times now that I know everything about fishing without, you know, ever having fished. Um, he has this, like, lifeguarding business, and he has this plan to teach inner city kids how to fish, and that's, like, his big dream goal, and he told me, I don't, he's like, I don't care if I have to sleep on the streets, I just want to teach kids how to fish, which I think is so adorable. <laughs> if you meet him, you would understand. Um, but it's just, it's so great to meet these guys and to realize that they have dreams and aspirations just like I do. And, you know, just like I want to get a job and be a tax-paying member of society, that's what Bruce tells me every day. He's like, I can't wait to pay my taxes one day. <laughs> I think it's so great. Um, I know these guys, and they know me. They know about my little sisters, my boyfriend, my roommate, my classes. I know how they lost their job. I know how they faced alcoholism and beat it. I know how they spent three years in jail because they were dealing drugs. I know about how their apartments burned down. Getting to know them gives a real face to homelessness that normally you, you don't really see. Um, you know, I did something over the summer called 100,000 Homes Campaign, where we just went out on the streets and took a census, you know, woke someone up as they were on the streets sleeping at four in the morning, asked them what their name was, asked them to fill out a questionnaire, and moved on. And that was my first real experience with homelessness. And this is such an amazing juxtaposition, and it is so, homelessness is such a dehumanizing act. And being at Srihup and meeting these guys and having a dinner with them every night and, you know, watching them help me do the dishes and watching them make fun of me because I apparently don't know how to use a mop, just getting to know them makes it so much more human. And having those dinners, doing dishes side by side, and then watching TV at the end of the night before they go to bed is the solidarity that Srihub tries to offer. And I know it doesn't come even close to real solidarity, but I think compared to a lot of the options that exist for the homeless in Philadelphia, I think what we're doing does really offer them that connection that they were missing before. Um, serving and working with people that you know makes it personal. I can't not go to the shelter anymore. If I miss a week, Hector's yelling at me the next week. Where were you? Why weren't you here? I missed you. Um, they make fun of me because I apparently don't know how to wash dishes. I guess I don't know how to do anything because <laughs> they're always mocking me. But they, they notice when you're gone. Um, and they really are friends now. And they're not homeless men. They're you know, people that, for a lot of reasons, I've come to admire. And it's really touching when one of them thanks me and tells me what Srihep has done for them. Um, but I'm always very quick to articulate everything that Srihep has done for me, too. And I think that coming together and that we're both getting so much out of this experience is a really great form of solidarity. Now many of you folks here are active in, in various capacities. If you have anything that you would like to share, please do so. If you have questions for any of the panelists, please ask away. I'm sure they would love to uh, entertain questions and I think you all did a magnificent job. I loved each and every one of you um, and the perspective that you shared. Anybody? 
Actually, yeah, I got a question. You said that Tree Hub started with just an idea, right? Yes. Is it something like that? A group of people just suggested and thought about and like, they're like, hey, we could actually do this, or how exactly did that happen? So Street Hub has a very long history. Um, I won't get into all of it, but Professor Stephanie Senna um, really came up with the idea. She teaches intro to history um, here at Villanova. And um, she, for her final, and I was in her class, and for her final, she asked, name a problem in the world, and how can it be fixed? And a lot of students wrote about homelessness and how homeless shelters that exist aren't working, um, legislature isn't working. Srihap also has an advocacy aspect for that reason. Um, and she was just overwhelmed by how many students seemed to really care about homelessness. And she looked into the homeless shelters of Philadelphia and found out the Ridge Center, which had 300 beds available every night, was closing. Um, and this was January of 2010. It closed in like April of 2010 and has stayed closed. There's 300 less beds every single night um, because of the NIMBY movement. So Professor Senna just sent out an email to all of the students. Can you explain that love for the NIMBY? Not in my backyard. Um, basically, the Ridge Center was in an up-and-coming part of town, and there were a lot of businesses. And the Ridge Center bussed in um, homeless people from the city to the outskirts of Philadelphia, where the Ridge Center was located. And businesses felt that it was bad for their business because they were um, they felt that it, the homeless people in the Ridge Center were scaring away customers. So they basically put up a fight and the Ridge Center was shut down um, in like the interest of business in Philadelphia or something like that. I don't know the real reason. So Professor Senna sent out an email to a bunch of, to all of her students that she just had and said, you know, I'm, I'm having this meeting. I have this idea that I want to pitch to you. Come out, hear what I have to say, and tell me what you think. So she pitched this idea um, and I loved it um, and so did about 15 other students who really committed to it. And we um, worked for the whole spring on finding a location, getting donations. I was in charge of donations, so I did a lot of that. We had a fundraising director. Um, and then I worked on it over the summer. And we opened in November is the short version. The long version involves a lot of people telling us that we couldn't do it. But <laughs> we proved them wrong. Does that answer your question? Um, so at each of our three shelters, we have um, a partner that we work with, people that are ex experts in homelessness. Um, at the first shelter, Old First, our partner is Bethesda Project. They do all of our intake, so they know the homeless population very well. They interview people, talk to them, know them, and figure out if they would be a good fit at um, Old First. And Bethesda Project is actually really cool because they have housing vouchers that they get from Philadelphia. And for all the men that stay with us for the whole season, um, they get a housing voucher at the end from Bethesda Project for you know, subsidized housing, which is amazing. Um, at our LGBT shelter, it's Boye of Philadelphia is our partner, and they do the same thing. They do our intake. <coughs> and then at the last shelter, the Arch Street, it's um, Project Home that does it. So they're all experts. They know the population. They know who would be a good fit with us. And we just we work with the men that they give us. Yeah, it's a, a student group meeting, and we're going to be showing the original Water for Solid documentary that was, they're, they're working on a new one, so this is the older one, but it's going to be next Tuesday um, at 7 p.m. in White 218. It's just kind of to give, because our Walk for Water is coming up, so it, we wanted to show the documentary to give people kind of a reference point about what Water for Solid is, so it should be really good. Um, actually, my question is for uh, Mary Beth, and it's kind of similar to Lupe's, um, but you I was going to ask, like, uh, because, like, you know, the Catholic workers, you know, so much about, like, houses and hospitality and stuff, have you ever, like, had to turn anybody away from, like, taking them in? Like, how do you uh, handle that? Um, if that has to well, people kind of come to us through word of mouth and through different other groups where we, like, an, like say, an agency that works with refugees who we know. And we only have room for a few people at a time or a couple, one or two families. So we might only take new people in, like take a, like the family we have now has been with us for a year and a half. Um, so in the interim, we've gotten a couple of calls and you know, we have had to turn people away. So we would just sort of try to network and talk to them about other options. 
And then we get people who come in through our clinic as well. But it's not like a, it's, it's, it's way different from a shelter in that it's, it's you, sometimes people come for very briefly. Like we would, more so in, in the past than now, taking, like if somebody was homeless and had the flu, we'd bring them home for a few days. So now that we've sort of shifted to more refugees and immigrants plus a mix of other folks, people usually stay about six months or a year. just so many good, so many positives, the relationships with the people, the great volunteers we have, the just so, so sort of a nice support network of folks who support us. I didn't mention that we're like, we, we survive off of private donations, we don't, we get a place to live, we don't get a salary, and um, we don't get any city or church grants or foundation money. We're not 501c3. We're not incorporated. We're not a nonprofit. We basically, people who read our newsletter will send us a check occasionally. And our, our costs are like extra, like our costs for a year for running the house and the clinic is probably the same as like tuition and room and board for a year at Villanova roughly. Maybe. Maybe tuition's a little higher these days. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I've never really, I've never really had any doubts. I didn't had no intention of doing it long term. It just sort of happened. But, but yeah, no, there's a lot, and there's a lot of variety, and there's like no boss, and there's like no bureaucracy, and there's a lot of flexibility, and you know, I mean, there's certainly challenges and frustrations in a variety of ways, but nothing enough to make me want to run yet. Just a question for. Um, so before you, before you mentioned it, actually, as you were talking, you said um, that you guys work for Westlaw and that you're providing them clean water so you're helping them create a system that lets them have clean water. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that it was because some students originally went there for a break trip. But um, you ever, like, struggle with the question of, like, why Westlaw? Meaning, like, why Westlaw and, like, not so many, like, other towns that have, like, similar problems? And it's like, how do you cope with that, you know? Like, just knowing that you are helping a specific group of people when there are, like, a lot of other people who need the same help. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I knew nothing about the water crisis before I started in Water for Sala. And just learning about it, we have, we've had speakers that have come talked about various parts of the world. And I had no idea that the global water crisis existed all over the world. So I think that, yeah, it definitely is something that you struggle with. But I think you have to keep in mind that you have to go little by little. Um, and West Lala is a municipality that has a bunch of different little towns, and we've you know, tried to hit as many towns as possible, giving them clean water systems. And I, I asked someone on our board of directors, you know, hopefully this nonprofit will keep going for years and years. And I, was, I asked them what happens when we hit all of Lala. Is it still going to be water for Lala, or are we going to stop then? And we talked about expanding and going even beyond Lala and going to Nicaragua. So you know, I think clearly there's not going to be no solution to solve the whole global water crisis. So I think you need to keep things in perspective and go little by little and just know that if you if you create something sustainable then that little by little will turn into a lot and will maybe one day hopefully solve a greater problem. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the Catholic Ordinary tends to foster community um, through like meals or matches or oh. <laughs> well, um, It's like, because we've been doing this for 20 years, there have been all different times and we've done different things. And we're actually really shorthanded right now, so we don't do as much of that. But we've traditionally had the Monday night dinner where whoever's living in the house, plus the community, plus an occasional random person would come and that would be our, our main kind of community builder. And then we do, um, we do a mass in potluck or some kind of religious service in potluck the first Monday of the month. And um, we also would do Bible studies, we do roundtable discussions, we do talks about various issues. For a long time, we were real involved working against the sanctions and the war in Iraq, and people will come and 
talk about whatever. So that would be sort of how we would build communities. So there's a, like a group of people who do come on Monday nights. And then for several years, we had other folks from the clinic who would come and just know that Monday night dinner was always open. So it's really kind of a mix. Now, at the moment, we're doing the first Monday of the month event, and like we're going to have a retreat in Lent, like a Friday night, all day Saturday retreat. We're going to look at the Lenten readings in Isaiah with Bishop Gumbleton. So that ought to be fun. That's like a little different. We do an annual Advent Bible study. Our, we've expanded to, we have a second house now, and we name that house after a woman from the New York Worker who started our annual Advent Bible study. She was a rabbinical scripture scholar and a Catholic worker in New York. So we named the house after her, and we keep that tradition. So, so we do our best. and. I mean, I think we could do, that's one area we could do a lot better. Like, uh, this is the time of year when I get calls. Hi, can you take 45 students from Wis some college in Wisconsin for the day and have them help you with a project? Like, hmm. You know, so it's like we try to do what we can do to connect people. And we do, the work groups often can be helpful in the garden, but because of the nature of, the clinic, we ask that our volunteers be steady volunteers, number one, so people don't feel like they're guinea pigs, and number two, because I think it's better for everybody involved, both the volunteer and the patient, and us to just have a steady group of people. Um, you know, so there's other people who would kind of like to look and see, and we don't really do a lot of that because, just because of the nature of. Well, yeah, it can be really hard. Um, one thing is kind of when you're there, you sort of don't see it all the time. So like I always notice if I'm out of town or whatever when I come back, it's sort of, you can sort of see the, the road into the neighborhood. The, nine months of the year, it's like really fine, but the summers are really hard. It's very hot, it's very dirty, and it's very loud in the summer. And yeah, it can get really hard. Um, the hardest thing for me is we, like my mom has a trailer at the shore, so we can like pack up for the day on a Saturday and go to the beach. And just seeing the neighbors, we have some older neighbors and neighbors with kids who sit on their stoop like five months of the year and packing up in the morning, have a good day, bye, and then come back at nine o'clock at night and they're still sitting on the stoop and it's 95 degrees. So it's really hard and you know, it's sort of like Part of me wants to like wear dark glasses and a mustache and sneak out, you know, so people don't see me. And the other part of me wants to like bring everybody along, and it does get it does get to be challenging. And there's times when it really ebbs and flows. Summers are always bad. Every summer, I'm ready to like move to Tahiti. But um, like last winter, we had uh, our own local serial killer. And there was a serial killer in Kensington, and two of the women were found dead within, like one was like two blocks from our house and one was two blocks from our clinic. And the whole neighborhood was completely unnerved. All the sex working women just disappeared. All the school kids were crazy. My kids were really upset, and it was really, really tense. And it's sort of moments like that that you go like, whoa. I mean, there's some, I mean, this month's Philadelphia Magazine lead story is sort of the next heroin epidemic, and it just paints a picture of the Kensington neighborhood and just, just how sort of all the folks coming all over from Jersey and the suburbs because it's such a den of heroin sales. And yeah, it can be really tough, but in the same, but there's also like 15 coffee houses within a mile as Fishtown gentrifies and Northern Liberties and and all the artists kind of come in, so we're like really right on the edge between those two areas. With the local folks who have been there a long time, sort of a third group, so it's, it, it makes for a very interesting dynamic, which I don't even pretend to have any answers. Can, um, do you have anything to say in regards to um, like 
parenting and that sort of like lifestyle? Well, I think there's so much good to teach a kid about compassion and about God and about goodness and about love and about being one with all of humanity. And I think my kids get to see and to meet so many really cool people. It's amazing, you know. One of our friends, you know, was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, Kathy Kelly. She'll come and she I saw her picture on the Peace and Justice wall. She'll come and visit for a couple of days and play a game with the kids. And like for to have your kids be able to meet somebody like that, that's amazing. And then to have, you know, Danny, who's sober some days and drunk other days, be sort of sloshing around on the sidewalk, and then on Sunday have him be in church and have my son give him the kiss of peace and him go, look at how great Danny is doing. I'm so, you know, Danny and me, we're buds, we're tight, you know. That's really cool. So it's just, it's just a mix. And many of my friends have had, um, uh, ha many of my friends and many Catholic workers have kids. And of those, a number of people have risked arrest and have actually done a lot of jail time. A friend of mine just got out of six months in jail for crossing the line at a nuclear weapons place somewhere down south. And when people say, oh, how do you do that to your kids? Oh, And the thought is sort of like you want to, to take the same kind of risks and the same suffering and the same challenge as somebody would who believes in war. Nobody questions, oh, how can you go to a war and leave your kids at home? Maybe some people question that, but that's sort of culturally accepted. But if you pour blood on a bomb to try to stop a war and then spend a year in jail, people would sort of criticize that. In a lot of ways, it's like the same thing. And then I also think the lifestyle, I think it's just the whole lifestyle, simple living is just a huge lifetime learning kind of a thing um, that, that I think it's good to start the lesson young. That yesterday I was taking my son to a doctor's appointment and we were getting on the L and I dropped a token and uh, I said, oh shit, I dropped a token. He goes, oh my God, I can't believe this. You are so Catholic. You are extremely Catholic. You go to church on Sunday and on Tuesday and, and, and you and you're nice to people. You're just so Catholic, and you just said shit twice. What is the matter with you? <laughs> so I was like, oh, hmm. I, never, I realized he noticed that we were extremely Catholic. So, yeah, it's funny. It's really, really interesting. It's really fun raising kids. Mary Beth specifically, but thanks for having me.